So I want to find out about what project you've been doing here and then try to see what we can learn from it in general about how you deliver projects that are in partnership. Do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Yeah. I, okay, just, just to frame things. I think all the good stuff we talk about we want to see happen happens best at a precinct scale. And the whole of the development industry, the planning industry, the architectural industry fundamentally starts from site by site development. When you look at the question of who's going to broker the deals that makes stuff happen at a precinct scale, generally if you've got a brownfield site that can be taken over by government you'll have a development agency, something like that, or you can sort of do it in a greenfield site with a developer. But that thing about what I describe as urban infill and infill not just putting in buildings but putting in tech, putting in activations, putting in cultural stuff. Mm. That's the big challenge of how do we do that in our urban areas. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, at the moment what we get is backyard infill yep. which is totally inadequate, dysfunctional mm. and yeah. unsustainable. So what you're suggesting is a precinct scale Yes. But to do that, you've got to bring people together. Yeah. yeah. And it's got to be driven by the community, and that represents the, you know, after state government and development agencies or a developer in Greenfields, it's the citizens in a place that yep. can make that happen. So, yeah, so the, the urban infill being the, the infill of building, but also the infill of the place. So creating that additional layer beyond just what is the buildings going to be. And I think that... Um, citizens are actually really good at defining what they need more of or what they need to see improved in their space because they actually live it. They're the sort of experts in their environment. So if we, if we build them into the precinct planning in a really serious way or have them lead it in some regards, mm. as much as our governance will allow them to, mm. I think it actually results in really good outcomes. And that's kind of what we've done here to a certain extent. We've done yeah. what we can sort of pushing in the edges. So what we've done is, independent of any specific project, we've just said, okay, let's design our place and work out what we think ought to happen. Yeah. Well, that's certainly the feeling that has driven our research, because to get this mid-tier transit to work, you have to have station precincts. Precincts are partnership-based, and they are each having a place. And recognition of that is beginning to filter through the idea of movement and place yeah. is now uh, a policy option that is being worked through at state government level. I don't think they quite get that the place, when it is needed, has to be a bottom-up process. Otherwise you don't get the place. Mm. You just say, oh, we'll put a little branding onto that and mm. call it something and it'll be a place. No, mm. it has to be a place that's driven by the values of the people yep. there. So how do you do that? Well, a few steps in this process. Um, we did a bit of work on values, really. We looked at some of the things that people wanted to see more of in the place. But, but ahead of that, we just had this civil society organisation that was organising parties. Street yeah. parties. Parties. Yeah. Parties. Yeah. But that's, and big events. But that's where the ideas come out because people yeah. are talking and they're throwing things around together and it's um, that's what people do, right? They sit around and they talk and they come yeah. up with, they complain and mm. then they whinge and then they come up with ideas and they solve things together and not much happens beyond that. Yeah. And I think what's happened here is there's been an active and intentional process of taking that and making it do something beyond just sitting around and having a drink, which is really nice. Mm. Um, and so you take that and you say, well, look, okay, we've got all these ideas. Mm. Like, what do we do with them? What's a good idea? And, and so, yeah. And I think the key thing is making that process ahead of and independent of any specific development arriving. Yeah. Because then you've got the, the ground where you're not having your attention drawn into that we've got to talk about the design yeah. of this tod or we've got to yeah. do this or that. It's almost like saying, and the position we've started from is to say, what do we need to do to make Leadable amazing? And, and it's going to be us who's going to do that. We sort of crafted hmm. a, um, a process. Do you want to talk about the MCA type stuff? Yeah, so we basically took all that thinking and we said, well, these are all, this is a bunch of things, right? What's the, 
what's the thing that's really going to give us a really great outcome. So we actually went through, you know, kind of this sort of slightly more academic process of thinking about the ideas that were generated and said, well, okay, let's identify what these are representing in terms of values. And we created some criteria that the ideas were representing. Um, and then we assessed all the ideas against our criteria. So we essentially did a multi-criteria analysis of fun ideas um, and, and some more serious ideas. So the sort of more cultural and social ideas were in there as well. And so that, that built us a framework of ideas that were not just good ideas, but that we tested against things that we want as a, as a society for this place. Um, so fun was one of them but so was making sure the place was inclusive. Mm. So we had this, and there was, I think we had six criteria in the end, but making sure that each of the ideas were tested against a series of different outcomes we were trying to achieve. Um, okay. So we we're pretty well, comfortable. Tell us about those six criteria, one of them being fun. Yeah. <laughs> which you can only derive from a process involving parties. Yeah, this and, is, and all our meetings. This is not the normal process. <laughs> and, and all our workshops, you know, we made an intentional decision to hold all our workshops, all our activities in bars. And what we found is you get 45 minutes of coherent thinking <laughs> before the drinks cut in and then it just gets random but you get a lot of creative stuff after that so you, you've got okay. to do good quality recording yeah. in that first 45 minutes and then have someone who's just sensing the the emergent creative directions yeah. Okay. Yeah. the other thing that we also did is made it by making it creative and fun we were able to engage the bureaucrats because they came after ours they weren't wearing their work hat yeah we were able to engage the developers who sort of want to mix it with the, the, you know, the riffraff yeah. or the, the, riff the citizens or whatever. But, the, the, but that also meant the developers who got involved came and listened. They actually heard what, that, what the community they were thinking about building in was talking about as things of importance. So that, you know, you get this really good mix of, you know, governance and developers and then just ordinary citizens. And actually yeah. the citizens are in charge of the space. So they're the ones leading the discussion. Um, and I think that was really important. Yeah, it sounds totally out of control to the average bureaucrat, <laughs> yeah. uh, even developer. But um, at some point, when you give it the, the classy term, multi-criteria analysis, you end up with the criteria. Yeah. So these six, what are these six? So, so fun is one, and I think uh, you kind of have to understand the context of Leaderville and Leaderville's got events and it's you know, sort of been known for having street parties and things like that. And a lot of the ideas were linked to fun. Yeah. But... But you can reframe the word fun as, yeah, yeah. as sort of culturally driven. Yeah. Livability. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the space to come together. But then one of the other criteria, and I kind of mentioned it, was um, that everyone's welcome. So everyone's invited. And that was, a, that was you know, around the need to have... A welcoming space for anyone yeah. doesn't matter whether they're five or they're 85 or they're um, disabled or they're homeless um, so we actually had and have in Leaderville uh, like a, a community of people that says we want to work to make it safer and more pleasant for our inclusive, homeless people so yeah. really inclusive okay. um, so is that one of your criteria that was inclusive. one of our yep yep okay so this green okay. Yeah, so green is obviously one of them as well, so environmentally sensitive, sustainable. Yeah. And um, the tech stuff comes under that, you know, the sustainable tech comes yep. under okay. that. Yeah. Um, and then we also had an economic criteria, yeah. so vibrancy is really what that was about. And yeah. so vibrancy was a way of describing we, wanted, we want the economy to work because we want the economy to build more people. Yeah. You know, so that, that's why we use vibrancy. Um, and then we had another one which was, was actually, it was kind of similar to the everyone's invited one but it was it was a little bit more about just making sure that the offer was diverse um, so that the, the that we were offering diverse numbers of things or diverse ideas or diverse outcomes um, so I think that's six or is it yeah, five well that's close <laughs> but I think that, I think the important thing in this process although it does sound random there is deep thinking that was going on behind it so in as much as um, we probably had about 12 months where most of the discussion was about well what are the good ideas mm. what could we do here what could we make happen 
the, and I think we had you had 50 at one stage in a PowerPoint presentation, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so there 50 was criteria. 50 ideas. 50 ideas, ideas okay. yeah. And what do you do with that? Yeah, yeah. and then the, the MCA process, we still run it in the same forum, it's still in the bar around the corner. Yeah. And we still got the punters wandering in and, yeah. and having it. By the way, that'll be a lot better when it's electric. <laughs> yeah, 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 it will. We want to root root that round the outside. Yeah, okay. we want to close this entirely. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, walking only here. Yeah. 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 But the, once we'd done that and we sort of knew what the ideas were, how this community, which is broad, it's the developers as well as the local government, whatever, we sort of knew what we wanted to happen. Then we wanted to arrange it spatially. Yeah. So we did yeah. a whole second process we called UX, which stands for user experience. So the idea was when you have traditional planning processes, it's done about height, bulk, allocation, infrastructure, whatever. We said, if you're going to design a city from the point of view of the experience of the user when they are there, what would it look like? Mm. And we had this arsenal of good ideas that had some sort of ranking as importance. Yeah. And then we basically allocated and did the plan um, and wrote it up as a 40 or 50 page document. And it's, you can see it on our design resources website. And the good thing is the city has basically taken that into its new town planning scheme. And, and the developers are happy with it? Yeah. They are. Well, That's it's important. It's so also the community, the developers and the council all want what you've come up with. Pretty yes. much. Yeah. yeah. So I think the developers quite like it because it's tangible. Yeah. It's not sort of, you know, we have this conversation, repetitive conversation about either developer contributions or developer bonuses. Um, and they can be a little bit intangible. They sort of come from some office somewhere and they get put into a plan. Whereas this one has come from a group of people in the community who've said these are good things that we like. And so the developers can, can latch onto that and say, well, if the community says they like it, then this must be a good thing to put in our application as a bonus. You know, so it kind of, it starts to tie the knot. And, I and it de-risks it for the developer. Yeah. Because our work, we haven't talked about this, we did a lot of work on style. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what, what is the thing that def makes leadable leadable? So it's this sort of strange combination of, yes, there is the architecture, but then there's also the culture. You know, and sort of one of the things is, there's a, it's been described as there's a modest grunginess. <laughs> so no one here is, you know, we're all a bit imperfect and we accept that. We're not trying to be the best or the most amazing. Um, so we've got a whole lot of material that explains that story. And that really de-risks de -risks it for the developers. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that de-risking is very important in this um, to understand because that's not what the state government does if they do a top-down process. No, it actually right. is a risk. Yeah. And there's a number of projects that have gone off the rails because of that yeah but um, it does take time mm. and uh, it's I, I dare say we could get better at it and quicker at it but uh, the process of change is probably not longer because when they go off the rails they take yeah. years to and get cost, back on again yeah. huge and amounts. the cost yeah, yeah. so the, right. the, the, when when you lose a community because the community doesn't trust you anymore it, like in most of my work, this is my experience, you add an extra four or five years to every process. As mm. soon as you lose that trust and you break that alliance with the community, it just blows everything up. Mm. And, it, it, and they don't come back and they're in the media and they make everything feel more risk averse and agencies start stepping away from things and all of a sudden we just don't achieve outcomes at all. Mm. Um, so it takes longer, I mean, this is probably a 10 year process really from when you first sat around a table. Yeah, I, yeah, look, I think the 10 year of, of yeah, that is, um, but the actual intense bit that we've yeah, done so is two, three years, yeah. two, three years. Yeah. And, but, I, but that just really, like, what it means is you need to provide that space. And I think some local governments are trying to provide that space with their community, but they're still t a little hands on. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something to break. Yep. And it is a very good model that you've developed and it's hard to see how you can transfer it totally because there's, there is a culture here of wanting that, I would think, mm. and there are other places like that, but not all of them. And particularly in the middle suburbs that are a bit poorer, 
is you will find the leaders who step up mm. and want to take on that role of the animateur. And I like the, you know, the equivalent because it means bringing alive. Yeah. Um, and it's more a question of finding those people and getting out of their way. Yeah. Um, and not using the project to drive it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you probably actually, come up with the same kind of ideas that that the top-down people have got. Yes. But yeah. it won't be delivered 100%. unless you've got that connection. Yeah. We've got. I was just going to say, we actually have some, I think we have some mechanisms in our system in Western Australia that does allow it to happen. Yeah. So, and if, and if local governments would be a little bit more progressive on this, they could probably fast track it a touch. And that, it, you know, it sounds pretty dry, but the strategic community planning, the visioning that local governments have to do is a nice avenue yeah. to bring it together, to find those people, to identify those people. But I think what's been happening up until now is local governments do it as a local government led, my outcome, my governance requirements approach. And what they might need to do is say, actually, this is your leading, your outcomes. Perhaps we give the community the control of this and run processes that let the community lead it a bit more. And then I think you can identify those those leaders in the community and then let them go a bit more. It's in the both local government and developers' interest to keep everything at the aspirational level. Mm. We want it to be green, we want it to be nice, we want it to be economic. I think then the challenge is to say to the community, okay, we will, we will draw this plan and it's going to be tangible, it's going to be on the yeah. ground and then you've got something that you can actually talk about, not just sort of like fluff around interpreting aspirations, but ground it in this is going to be a reality. So drawing it back to our project, we're trying to suggest that you can't make the place work very well unless you can get rid of some of these cars. Yeah. And <laughs> Agreed. I've just had that experience trying to find parking here. Um, I would prefer to have come on a trackless tram. Now the trackless tram network, if that comes, you need to be able to to welcome these 23 storey buildings, yep. but also you need to welcome a reduction in parking that goes with it, so that people seamlessly move into a way of getting here and moving around in here, moving around walking mm. and getting here on that trackless tram rather than driving. Do you think that's possible in the process you've developed? Yeah, look. Um, to, what, did you want to go on that or shall I? I'll go. No, you go. Yeah. Okay, so I'll one probably of, add something. One of the good ideas that we came up with is because uh, we've got large car parks around here, yeah. And so the idea is to uh, we call it the armadillo, and that was one of the ideas. The surface is multi-storey car park. You wrap it in solar panels, so it can be a solar generator. You can stick a battery in the bottom. It can turn this place all renewable. And the idea is the building is designed in some, such a way that it can be um, repurposed at a later date to help manage those transitions. As you, because one of the dilemmas is people don't like dramatic change and often things like the arrival of a new public transport infrastructure is a dramatic change and people are a little flustered. So if you can, once again it's this about being smart about the de-risking process. So the idea of condensing all the parking into one place which then frees up all this other space to do things like a trackless tram thing or, or, or a, you know a scooter rack um, or all that type of thing yeah. it makes things a lot more but it's not saying cut the car out straight away no. okay sounds good you've already thought of it excellent yep. <laughs> do you want to add to that oh no i was just going to say that the other thing about having lo a long conversation with people is you've got the time to talk about things like parking mm. and you know the first discussion about parking is always I need more mm. and then as you as you discuss what you need as a community you discover pretty quickly that you don't need more parking it doesn't make people attracted to an area mm. in a you know we don't sit here and go oh there's a nice car park mm. um, so when you've taken time to have a conversation you can start to myth bust a little bit mm. and start to dispel some of those illusions and you know, people discover that there are other people in their neighbourhood that don't have a car or don't use cars at all or don't need parking at all or they live in a unit 
and they don't have it, they've got an empty car bay downstairs. And so you start having this ability to really unpick that, you know, the West Australian fact of everyone having two cars. <laughs> and immediate and proximate parking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think another thing that uh, travels in this whole question is the, if the civil society is taking leadership like this, we can act as a buffer for the local government and state government. Mm. So because we don't have any power, we don't have money, we don't have any resources, we Just can... Good ideas. Yeah, and thought leadership. And so, you know, you can get into a circumstance where someone from the local government may ring you up and say, we've got this person who's arcing up about parking. Could you have a chat to them? So we're going to have a chat to them about, well, there's a broader way to look at things. Yeah. And that acts as a buffer that is makes it a lot easier for local government to be brave. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay, final thing. It's 10 years down the track. We've got trackless trams coming through here. We've got still a really good and even bigger Metronet system that's connected here. Um, and you've got a lot more buildings that have come. Just describe what it's like being in this place, this leadable place. There'd be huge arguments about electric scooters. <laughs> yeah. No, but could we, could we say, just for a start, it would be quieter? It, yeah. this, this noise, this sort of, this, you know, background racket of cars and engines and pumping tyres, etc. are gone. And the thing that you hear is the birds yeah. and the people talking yeah. and the music at each of the restaurants. I, I, you know, it could feel like a really generous environment of people enjoying life. Mm. This, the sound of cars is not people enjoying life. Yeah. It has, it's almost the opposite. It sort of feels to me like the, the, the sound of stifling. Um, but when we have this, we, at the end of COVID, we had this wonderful experience. This is set up, this area here is set up as a, to be able to close. We had three weeks of the street being closed permanently and it was amazing. The whole street was covered in tables and that was so that the traders could have enough space to serve people with the COVID restrictions. But it was outstanding, you know, people sitting in the middle of the road, under the trees, at tables, it felt like a place that people should be. And in fact, I now refer to this street when it's closed as being open. So this is, this is currently, this is a street closed because we've got cars running through it. When it's open, it's a place where people are. That's, That's how Open I see it. Open for people, closed for cars. Yeah. yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, for me, it would be about, you know, one of the dreams is a water corp, they've got a drain that runs through the yeah. middle of Lidl, and we want to convert that into a pedestrian walkway. And I think we can do it. I think yeah. we're well on the way. Mm. Very good. I think that'll do us. Cool. Brilliant. <laughs>